Real quick, before we get into the show, I wanted to share a new service called Gatita that Ken and I have been using that has made us over $10,000 in Amazon reimbursements. The service requires no monthly subscription, and Gatita collects a small percentage of the money they recover for you. It takes less than five minutes to set up and works on all Amazon marketplaces. Go to gatita.com, G-E-T-I-D-A, and enter promo code FTM400. That's FTM for firing the man, 400, to get your first $400 in reimbursements commission free. How much money does Amazon owe you? Welcome everyone to the Firing the Man podcast, a show for anyone who wants to be their own boss. If you sit in a cubicle every day and know you were capable of more, then join us. This show will help you build a business and grow your passive income streams in just a few short hours per day. And now your hosts, serial entrepreneurs, David Schomer and Ken Wilson. Welcome to another episode of the Firing the Man podcast. I'm your host, David Schomer, and today we're diving into the world of e-commerce automation and operations management with a true industry innovator. Joining us is Parag Mamnani, the founder and CEO Got that right. All right, of Webgility, uh, a leading e-commerce automation software that has been helping businesses streamline their operations and grow efficiently. Prague has a rich background in technology and entrepreneurship, and he has dedicated his career to solving complex challenges faced by e-commerce businesses. With Webgility, he has built a platform that integrates seamlessly with various e-commerce channels, helping businesses automate their processes, manage their finances, and gain critical insights into their performance. In today's episode, we'll explore Prague's journey from tech enthusiast to successful entrepreneur, discuss the key challenges in e-commerce operations, and learn how automation is transforming the way businesses scale. Whether you're an e-commerce veteran or just getting started, this conversation will offer valuable insights into making your business more efficient and profitable. Let's get into this. Prague, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Uh, You did a fantastic job on that script. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you for that introduction. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to get things started, uh, can you share with our listeners a little about a little bit about your story into founding Webgility and what inspired you to focus on e-commerce automation? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I graduated from college with a computer science degree uh, at the height of the dot-com bust and there were no jobs. So entrepreneurship sort of was a force necessity. I had to figure out how to make money. And uh during my last couple of years of college, I would roll out of bed and make cold calls selling e-commerce websites. At the time, there were a few open source platforms. Shopify didn't exist. There's no easy way to get going. You know, you had to kind of install things on a server, get your website built and do all the muckery around hosting. Um, so yeah, just those, that's where my kind of training wheels and e-commerce, obviously Amazon was starting to grow. eBay was seeing its time. So lots of businesses kind of looking at ways to expand online. So that got me into building an agency. We were developing e-commerce websites and launching e-commerce businesses or even moving retailers online. Fast forward seven, eight years into that agency, I got an opportunity to work at Amazon and I was running a product there called Web Store. And again, an e-commerce platform for small businesses. So e-commerce is kind of all I've been eating, sleeping, breathing the last like two decades and pretty much, you know, working with small businesses firsthand or even being at the platform, um, it was very clear to me that e-commerce was going to be the future, that more and more retailers were going to move online. And when I looked at kind of that space, there was definitely a lot of platforms out there and solutions, but something that really struck me was that almost everyone would talk about their QuickBooks and their financial system. And they didn't quite know how to do the right financial reconciliation for what was selling online. Because there's a whole new stream of data. And the more channels they sell on, the more different types of data. There's no real standardization around even how that data is provided to a seller. And so I thought that that was a big opportunity. And, you know, fast forward now 15 years, Webgility uh, has been, you know, serving tens of thousands of brands. And yeah, we're still trying to help solve that problem of how do you know, businesses selling on multiple e-commerce channels, 
kind of do their bookkeeping automatically? How do they do their financial reconciliation? How do they do compliance with sales tax? And also if it dabbled a little bit into, you know, as you look at omni-channel, like how do you keep your inventory in sync? Like what are all the nitty gritty operational challenges that, uh, you know, businesses face when they're going online? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I love that. And, and, um, and boy, do you have a track record in, e- in e-commerce two decades, which is outstanding. And one thing I think it that uh, kind of separates you from some other uh, people that we've had on the show is you worked at Amazon and, and, and understand the inner workings of, of that organization. How has that shaped uh, how you've, how you've built out Webgility? Um, whenever I'm asked this question, the thing I like to say is that Amazon's like a fast track MBA, you know, all the things that you, you, you go to college, like most people learn theoretically, Boy, you you have to cram that into just a matter of months, if not a couple of quarters. You kind of pick up all the skills. And Amazon just also has this very unique, I mean, there's a reason why they're one of the top 10 companies on the planet. Like they just have this DNA and uh, culture that's very data-driven, very experiment-driven. It's obsessed about growth. And so, you know, I... I think two years was a long stint. I picked up a lot of things and absolutely it's shaped everything. In fact, about the way that I run Webgility, um, uh, first and foremost, being very data-driven, like really thinking about how to grow the business, how to run the business from all the metrics. So um, the data, the tech stack that we have and uh, awareness of what's happening all the way from you know leads to sales to to ongoing implementation to metrics around engineering and support and customer success, everything's data-driven and um, also a lot of experimentation, listening to customers and iterating. Um, Yeah, I could keep going, but yeah, tons of learnings and it's definitely shaped the way that, um, you know, I've built and kind of been running Webgility. Of course, you know, over the years, you kind of start to add some of your own tools to the tool belt, but uh, there's very foundational running both an agency and then learning a lot from my days at Amazon. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, today we're going to be talking a lot about automation. And so to start that conversation off, why do you believe automation is critical for the success of e-commerce businesses today? Uh, Well, (laughs) if you ask me, automation is the difference between survival and death. So e-commerce, in the world of e-commerce, it's now become so easy to sell. It used to be it was hard to figure out how to sell online. Now it's incredibly easy to sell. The question then is, if everybody can sell, what makes you different? And I believe that the number one thing that makes you different is how well you've developed your tech stack, how automated your business processes are, so that you can find that razor thin margin that you have in your e-commerce business and continue to accelerate your growth. And beyond, I would say, you know, data, the second thing that I think is sort of really differentiating is uh, is your brand. So um, if you don't have your automation and your operations right, the only other way you're going to survive is by creating this unique brand and a unique presence online. Otherwise, it's really hard. It's really, really hard to win in e-commerce without having automation and having a solid brand. Yeah, absolutely. And and I the the statement of it's the difference between survival and death is uh boy does that statement punch hard, but you're absolutely right. Um and so what what would you say to the entrepreneur? Let's take customer service as an example. Uh and I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, in this that really struggle with off- offboarding um certain tasks. And so what would you say to the entrepreneur that says you know, my customers are really important to me and I need to respond to every uh, customer service request myself um, and automation, you know, would scares me. What, what would you say to that entrepreneur? Well, I would say to them, um, put simply, uh, you know, automation does not mean replacing humans, right? Um, and so uh, just like I mentioned, you know, automation has to be kind of what gives you that competitive edge your human element, your brand, your the way that you react and manage customers is also going to give you an edge. So it's not enough to just put automation and bots behind everything. It's important to put your touch on it. You know, Sal Altman will kind of famously 
said, oh, you know, I see billion dollar startups by run by two companies. These are outliers. You know, really the business, the you know, small businesses are not going to thrive without that human element. That's what differentiates them. You know, we love Amazon for how quickly it delivers stuff, but man, uh, you know, customer service is what separates them as well, right? Like how easily you can return items and small businesses until they can kind of build a muscle of automation plus supplement it with their kind of human element. That's how they're going to be unique and that's how they're going to win. Okay. Okay. I, I, I really like that. So what are some operational challenges that e-commerce businesses face and how does WebGility address them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, without this being a full sales pitch on WebGility, I think, you know, small businesses and e-commerce merchants face a lot of different challenges, right? Right off the bat, you know, you got to figure out which category, what's the right product to sell, what's the pricing, where are you going to do your procurement, what channels are the best channels to sell on, how are you going to promote it, your marketing, your cost of acquisition. There's just a lot of things that merchants need to think about. The area where we focus and where I spend most of my time is first and foremost, um, operational excellence. How do you really streamline a number of your operational tasks so that you get time back in your day? Time's your most precious commodity as an entrepreneur, and you want to be spending it on the highest leverage places of your business. You don't want to be spending your time keying in data, having to worry about whether your inventory level is up to date at the right places. You don't have to be spending hours every week with doing your bookkeeping. You don't need to spend 20 hours a month trying to close your books and finish, figure out just how much money you made. There's just places in the business that I find entrepreneurs spend too much time. And to your early question, I think it's also because maybe they're afraid a little bit of, you know, spending the time on software. They're very comfortable rolling up their sleeves, kind of packaging the boxes, figuring out what's the best way to market, looking at all the tools for keyword optimization and so forth. But, you know, operational kind of excellence and closing books, managing your financials is often an afterthought. And I don't think it should be because the moment you start to really generate any kind of traction, those are the things that actually slow you down. So I find, for example, I, I mean, I could, you know, laundry list of customers who haven't even standardized their naming convention for their products. Like they don't have a good SKU name and they get a lot of volume. They decide to launch some bundles. They add some adjacent products. Next thing you know, they don't have a really consistent catalog and they can't automate it when they span to another channel. So it's kind of like getting those financial basics right. And as you think about launching one channel or expanding to more channels, those are all the operational elements that WebGility helps solve. And that's where I spend most of my time. Happy to dive in, you know, to any specific area. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of challenges for SMBs. Absolutely. And I, let's dive into the financial side of things. And I think that to me, when I get my P&L, that is this, my scorecard for how I did. It, to me, if, and I go down to net income and this is, hey, you, did, you had a good month, you did good. It, it is the, the culmination of all of our team's efforts. And so, but I, I don't think that everyone shares that attitude on, on a P&L. And honestly, I, my background's in accounting. And so I, I love that, but um, the P&L is sometimes intimidating to people. And so um, what are some areas that you think entrepreneurs, or, you know, where should they be spending time as it relates to understanding the financial health of their business? Yeah, that's a great question, man. I think most entrepreneurs overlook the importance of cash flow. There's one thing to be looking at your monthly profitability, but when you look at an e-commerce business, you've got a few big expenses, right? Number one, your people. And if you're a small uh, business and, you know, you're trying to optimize everything, you don't have a lot of staff, maybe you've outsourced your fulfillment, your people costs might be a little lower. And your second biggest cost is your inventory, right? How much are you going to be buying? Your third biggest cost is customer acquisition. So people, inventory, and acquiring customers. 
all these three things happen over different periods of time. And you've got a bank balance that you need to manage and a stream of revenue coming in and money flowing out. If you don't understand how much money is coming in and going out almost on a daily basis, you don't have that edge that those fast growing brands have. They've figured out how to master their cash flow so that they're able to, I mean, something as simple as knowing your cash flow so that you can use the 30 day flow from your credit card to get more inventory or to beef up your uh, advertising. Like, if you're just looking at a monthly PL, I think that's great, but it's that's even not enough. I think you need to be looking at your cash flow more frequently. You need to have a really strong sense of the money flowing through all of your different channels. That's where you're going to find your competitive edge and you'll find hidden opportunities to really accelerate your growth. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you're so right. And you, you look at what kills a lot of businesses, it, it is that lack of cash flow management. And it's a real challenge, especially, you know, I, I look at some of the businesses that I run when we're placing orders that won't be sellable for 120 days. And then of course, Amazon's, <laughs> Amazon's going to hold on you to your- rack up that storage fees. <laughs> oh, I know. And, and um, that's something that is absolutely critical uh, to be thinking about cash flow today and cash flow over the next- six months to a year. And, and so I really, I, I really like that. Yeah, um, and you talked about profitability in the PL. I just want to also emphasize, I think most business owners are savvy enough where they understand their high level profit. I think they have a good sense of how much money they're making. Where I think they're missing things, missing out is I don't think they understand which products are making the money. I don't think they have a great sense of what channels are making the money. Um, and so you got to go a couple of clicks in, find your profitable products, find your loss makers. And really that's where the fine tuning happens. And that's where we see the brands that go from one to 10 to 50 million in revenue. They're accelerating because they have really mastered those details. And now they're really thinking at a skew level, how they can really optimize to drive faster growth. Let's dive into that a little bit more as it relates to like skew level profitability, as well as platform profitability. And, and I, this is something I was looking at um, last week was uh, profitability between Amazon and Walmart and the different fees that are associated with that. And, and, um, and so why don't we start here? Why is it important to have a good understanding of, of SKU level and platform level profitability? Yeah. So um what typically happens is, I mean, let's just use Amazon as an example, right? If you're just looking at your top line, you're going to be looking at your overall sales. That's going to give you your top line revenue. That's how much money that you've collected or Amazon's collected on your behalf. But every 15 days, when that settlement comes in, you're not going to be getting the same amount of money because Amazon's going to be deducting all of its fees it's also going to hold a reserve based on your history of returns, uh, uh, re refunds, and so forth. And so you could have made, you know, you could have had a million dollars in revenue, but you might only get $800,000 as a deposit. Right off the bat, that means you have to wait two weeks before you know how much actual cash you're going to get in your bank. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't understand that, your orders today does not translate into money in your bank in two weeks. Like you got to know, you got to have visibility of your fees and deductions. You need to look at the trends of those fees. And ideally, you want to be looking at transactions as they come in. So you have a good sense today of what kind of collections you can have. It's also not great reporting if you're not tracking your top line and your expenses because you could be under reporting your revenue because you're only looking at the net deposits you got from Amazon as your revenue instead of your total revenue minus all your fees. So you have to have a really good sense of your fees. Otherwise your financials are frankly just off. And if if 
right off the bat, on average, you know, I would say it's about 15%, call it 20 on Amazon for a deduction off of your top revenue. You're likely report misreporting your revenue by 20% if you don't break down all of your fees collection and get it accurately recorded in your financial system. And that has obviously tons of implications, not just on cash flow, but just even valuation of your business. You're misreporting your revenue. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is that is so critical as you're steer, trying to steer the ship in the right direction. And, and so um, what uh, in terms of across platforms, where do you see, uh, you know, if I think about growing my business, I can launch new products, which uh, if I'm being honest, and I, I don't think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in this space are, if I launch 10 products, three of them are going to be home runs. Two of them are going to do okay. Five of them I'm going to kill in the next year because uh, they're they're a failure yeah, to watch. Thirty percent win rate would be pretty good. Uh, yeah, and and I yeah I've, I've been um, so yeah I but that's that's kind of risky, right? Thirty percent win rate. Um, but then I look at well, why don't I take these existing products? Why don't I take my heroes into new marketplaces? Um, whether that be expansion into Walmart, expansion into Amazon Canada, or Amazon UK, and and that is intimidating. And I, I, we made this jump three years ago and dealing in different currencies is uh, my brain has been thinking in US dollar my entire life. And, and the fact that currency fluctuations are moving and every time you change from US, you know, from uh, euro to dollar, you're going to get hit. Um, and so it, it does kind of make your head spin. And so where are some challenges you've seen entrepreneurs, what are some challenges you've seen entrepreneurs have uh, as it relates to, you know, going into new platforms? Yeah, I, listen, I, I think it's uh, it's debilitating when entrepreneurs start off and they've achieved some amount of success on a platform. Uh, sometimes I've seen actually people just start off trying to do too many channels at once. And that's a, usually a recipe for disaster. Uh, but my recommendation is usually start off on one and really get it right. <laughs> and, and you know, set yourself a course of what you think is the right level of revenue, the profitability that you want to achieve that's going to make you feel like you've had success on that channel. Or give yourself also like a cutoff time. Like if I'm not able to make this channel successful, I need to do something different, right? Go somewhere else. Um, broadly, I think about this in two major streams. I, I, I know a lot of uh, your listeners are marketplace sellers. And so marketplaces for me are like a great way to experiment, right? Because you've got the traffic already. You just need to fine tune your listings, your pricing. And I'm, I'm, I don't mean to make it overly simple because it's not, but, but at least you're not having to invest in a whole lot of advertising avenues and building your own website and brand, which I think is the second kind of component or second type of seller. If you're going to build your own brand and launch your own e-commerce store, you're taking on a whole new skill set of learning marketing and campaigns and running ads and so forth. But if you're starting off on a marketplace, I think you got to really fine tune, find those three out of 10 winners and set yourself some goals. And once you've mastered that, recognize that adding another channel is you know, it can be almost double the effort unless, again, to my point earlier, you have some automation in place, right? So it's one thing to understand currency, but it's an entirely different to understand the competitors in those geographies to be able to understand the sales ranking you're going to get in the U.S. versus other geographies. What's going to happen if you go from, say, selling on Amazon to selling on Walmart? You're talking, um, you know, you're going to need price pricing tools to really get those numbers right across them. How are you going to allocate inventory between your two channels? If you're going international, how are you going to handle fulfillment, uh, you know, in the U.S. versus shipping internationally? You just have to build like a lot of, you need to build a lot of skills and and kind of rigor around channel expansion and so I typically, you know, my recommendation and things I've seen successful is really master one channel and then add channels over time, but really add them as you acquire the skill, experiment, and also kind of keep it in the same geography. International expansion definitely opens up 
another set of skills that you need to acquire, which you want to be prepared for, because it's not just a matter of listing the product there. It's really getting everything else, you know, formulated right. So it is a heavy lift. Absolutely. And, and where does automation play in, in that? If somebody is is wanting to expand, but they don't feel as though they have the time, uh, where does automation play in that expansion and scaling? Yeah, I mean, listen, shameless plug for Webgility, but, but you know, the first place that automation comes into picture is how do I put my catalog up, right? So we offer a solution to list your products on multiple channels. So if you're selling on one and you decide to add another, you can take the catalog and publish it up to the channel. So that gets you a baseline of all your products. You don't have to replicate and kind of manually enter things. Um, so listing is one place that that automation can really help. Second is order management. So, uh, you know, Agility can handle orders from all the different channels and we streamline, we can handle them in different currencies. Um, so we can take care of all of that and just bring all your data in neatly and record it into QuickBooks so that your financials are accurate in respect of how many channels you sell on. Um, the third is keeping your inventory updated. So on an ongoing basis, if you want to allocate inventory differently, like, or you have the same inventory across the board, when you sell on one channel, you want the other channels updated with the right inventory accounts. That's another place where automation can really help. Um, uh, you know, I can think of, you know, fulfillment uh, kind of things as well. We can automate purchasing workflows. So as you expand channels, your sales velocity might go up. Maybe you run out of stock more frequently. We can auto-generate purchase orders for your vendors. So there's a lot of different parts of the tech stack. The moment you add another channel, you have to make a lot of choices, even pricing, right? What's the price on one channel versus price on another? Uh, lots of different places that automation can be very helpful because now you're, um, you know, not only are the channels different, but they will impact the velocity of sales and they'll impact the type of buyer that's coming your way, even segmenting all the customers, right? So you want to track all your customers that are coming from, say, one channel separately from customers coming on another channel, be able to market to them differently. There's so many considerations um, and getting that data right and automating all of that with your financial system is is kind of our forte. And we, we you know, we've seen Companies, um, you know, I'll just give you one example. Um, I, I bring up this story a lot because I'm a big fan of uh, of his. Dan, uh, he runs a, uh, ran previously kind of a small retail location out of Sacramento selling baseball products, uh, Bases Loaders company. And he went from one brick and mortar location to now multiple warehouses across the U.S. and is selling on over 15 online channels and he's mastered automation to the point where other brands in the in the sports category he's helping manage their business and run their operational flow through webgility so it's like it's very powerful once you can figure out how to go from you know one to many but be able to put a system in place that keeps all your data flowing accurately very nice very nice and yeah to to keep track of of uh you reach a point where keeping track of things in a spreadsheet is just no longer viable. And I, I, my brain is organized into rows and columns. I love Microsoft <laughs> Excel. I've, I've frequently said if, if you were to remove uh, Microsoft Excel in the internal combustion engine, the world would stop. And I agree uh, with that. Totally, <laughs> totally. Even though, even though I'm a, I, I love automation, uh, you know, spreadsheets are not going away, man. We're, we're going to still need them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but it's, I think that is something that that entrepreneurs they, they'll reach a point where where you know manually inputting things and keeping track of things in a spreadsheet just is no longer efficient and it soaks up a lot of time and resources to to keep that going. So absolutely, yeah. So next topic I want to dive into is AI, and this is definitely changing the landscape of e-commerce. And in my opinion, it's here to stay. And, Absolutely. and it's a super powerful tool. And so I'm interested to, to hear from you. How are people leveraging AI for automation and to grow and scale their businesses? Yeah, absolutely. This this is uh, kind of top of mind. In fact, we just uh, I just did a webinar yesterday with uh, a whole bunch of folks um, talking about AI and kind of practical tips on how e-commerce businesses can start to leverage AI. It's to your point, it's here, it's here to stay. 
And, uh, you know, it's about time everybody starts u- utilizing it. When we ran a poll in the podcast, it was uh, uh, 50-50, like 50% of people had kind of adopted AI and 50% hadn't. So maybe a, a little bit of a tell on what's happening in the space. But, um, you know, first of all, I'd say that AI is is still in its early innings. There's still a lot that, of experimentation that's happening. Um, ChatGPT, when it was launched a couple of years back now, really kind of, you know, opened up everyone's imagination and just, it was so powerful and remains really powerful, of course, today that how, you know, you can go from these complex screens and UI and just a whole different way of interacting with software, right? Uh, you're, you're now typing in prompts and interacting with a bot. And also I think the notion of generative AI, which really just is all about how can I generate new types of content? right? Um, that's really captured the imagination as well of, of entrepreneurs. So first and foremost, I, I feel, um, you know, there's already a lot of great tools out there. In fact, you know, places like, you know, say even Shopify has got the, its sidekick that helps answer some questions about your business. Um, uh, Webgility, we launched our AI assistant a couple of weeks back. Uh, it's in beta and, um, the couple of places where I think AI can be really, really helpful. First and foremost, I think it's that we've, you know, it's the best way to get answers to questions. Um, we often spend time kind of searching, browsing, looking at dashboards, looking at reports. Wouldn't it be great if we could just ask them questions and get answers to them instead of having to f- go search and look for it, right? So that's the one kind of really impactful place where I think also just looking into the future, I think that's how interaction between users and software is going to evolve, right? We're going to go from really doing a lot of stuff on screen to really just asking questions, interacting with bots. And this is going to become more ubiquitous, especially as Apple introduces its AI agents, because then it's going to be in the palm of, you know, uh, a billion users. Um, And then we'll really start to see their behavior change. But uh, the first, I think, real place is, you know, getting answers quickly. And we've put that into effect for our business, for our customers. So today you can log into WebGility and you can ask it basic questions about your business and it'll give you answers. Over time, you can ask it complex questions. Over time, it's not only going to answer your questions. I think the second thing that's going to be really valuable is for it to give you predictions, for it to tell you what is to come. And so AI will be very powerful there. And the third, I think most relevant to this com- you know, conversation we've been having around automation is instead of just information, what can it actually do for you? What actions can it take for you? So uh, we've just gotten started, but um, simple things like post all my orders to QuickBooks, sync all my inventory across my channels. You could just have a conversation or update my price uh, across all my channels for this product from this to that. Um, You know, set the inventory levels to low for now or, you know, change this, there is going to be so much capability added to these AI agents. Uh, We're just getting started. And I'm sure there's going to be tons of innovation. Um, I know Amazon invests a lot more in innovation on the consumer side before it spends time on on tools for businesses. But, you know, Amazon has got its Q uh, agent, which I think is pretty powerful. Um, You know, Meta is obviously investing tremendous amounts. Uh, Google's got Gemini. Shopify's got its sidekick. I think there's going to be lots of innovation in e-commerce and AI is uh, going to really, really beneficial, really be beneficial. And those early adopters that can kind of pick up the technology that are not shy to, to use it and really put it to work. Like, you know, put an AI assistant to help you kind of take actions, put an AI assistant to help your customers get quick answers to support questions. There's just a lot of different opportunities where you can capitalize on now and you don't need to really wait. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, with a, a fellow entrepreneur on the podcast, I would like to talk about the early days of WebGility. Uh, it, it seems as though most companies start with an aha moment. Someone's sitting often by themselves and, and a light bulb goes off. And so can, can you share a little bit about the growth and, and what was the aha moment? And then what, what did you do after that? Yeah, yeah. I had that aha moment towards my final days at Amazon. Um, you know, I've always, uh, it, it's funny, I, I love, by the way, the, the name of your 
your podcast, Fire the Man. Um, as much as I enjoyed Amazon, you know, while I was there, it was always like the back of my mind was, okay, what, what, when am I going to start my next venture? Um, and so as you're thinking about that, to your point, like I was thinking back, what were the pain points that I saw when I was working with small businesses and brands launching online? And then what were the problems I was seeing Amazon sellers face on a constant, on a daily basis? And I could clearly see there was going to be too much data. There were going to be too many apps. There were going to be lots of channels. And it was going to get really messy unless there was going to be some software that could put it all together. So if you actually go, I have this internally in my slide deck, but like if I go back to like day one, I had three things written on a whiteboard. Integration, automation, insights sort of three-legged stool, you have to solve integration because you're going to have too many channels and systems. Data has to be integrated well. Number two, you have to have automation because you can be doing things manually. And last but not least, you conquer integration and automation. Now you must get much better insight because the large enterprises have the data at their fingertips, they are running their systems through a lot of different places, but they can put it all into a data lake. They can run tons of queries on it. They can see what's happening from procurement to fulfillment. And um, how can we give that power to small businesses? So that was the aha moment for me. I wrote it down and that's what kind of got me going with Webgility. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it's been foundational. This is kind of how we've been continuing to to invest in Webgility and for our customers is how can we, how can we help them integrate more things? How can we help them automate more things? And what are those insights we can deliver that'll really give them that edge? Okay, okay. Um, I, I love that. I love that story. And I, I like how the, the very beginning started with three words um, and, and, and built out from there. So uh, prior to recording this podcast, you and I were chatting and, and you had some, some questions uh for me and, and and we said let's let's pause let's save those for the podcast um and definitely want to give you an opportunity to ask me those because i i think it'd be a great conversation yeah yeah i mean you know you're in the world of amazon and marketplaces and you've your audience is in finance um man i've been doing this now a couple of decades uh i'd love to hear you know how has sort of the e-commerce accounting, the financial problem evolved for you? Um, what's your perspective on, what's your take on Webgility? Maybe some of the software solutions that are out there. How are merchants, like how are you solving this? How, how do you feel like other business owners should solve this uh, in terms of just getting their data right and managing their financials more accurately? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't think that QuickBooks is a, a one size fits all for all businesses. One thing that, you know, when you talk to a lot of business owners, they'll often tell you that the the industry that they work in is unique. And maybe I am I am say, I am doing that same thing, but I'll give an example of of how e-commerce is different and how financial reporting needs to adjust. Uh, in a typical business, you are writing a check or swiping a credit card for all of your business expenses. And you know the amount that you're writing a check for or swiping your credit card for. Now, that is not the case for an Amazon seller. You, there are a number of expenses that are unknown that need to be accounted for that you're not writing a check for and you're not swiping a credit card for. And in our business, uh, so there's a, a phrase, tacos, total advertising cost of sale. I, there's a, a metric that we've come up in our business called AF COS, which is Amazon fee cost of sale. And what we do is we dig deep into the DRSR report and we, we dig out all these nitty gritty details of expenses that were being charged. And what we found is, you know, our average AF COS across three brands is 8%. And, you know, when I'm managing a business to, t you know, if I'm talking to the PPC manager, if I ask them to take uh, tacos from 20% to 12%, uh, that's a big undertaking and it's going to have a big impact on sales. Now, mm -hmm. uh, if, if we can manage our AF cost of Amazon fees, um, maybe 
do removal orders or disposals or really monitor those fees, um, then it, it's just an easier move for the business. And so I always say what gets measured gets managed. And there are a lot of things that are tough to manage as, as an Amazon seller. And just when you get a great system in place, Amazon will change. An example of this would be uh, they're introducing a new penalty for returns. If your return rate is above industry average, you get penalized. And that's something that if you are not in the details, and and I will sh- I will say you have to dig deep to find these reports. They are not on the main tab. There is not a, a drop down menu that says here's a list of everything we're charging you for this month. And so that that's an example of of where I think you know. QuickBooks is a good base. However, the financial reporting process to arrive at good financials in QuickBooks, I think needs to be adjusted for things like this. And especially, you know, I think it is easier to expand internationally through Amazon than it would be running at like a brick and mortar store. That's right. And so I think more people earlier in their entrepreneurial journey make that jump. Um, I was four years into running a business and uh, I was dealing in US dollar, Canadian dollar, Euro, British pound, uh, Pakistani ruby, and uh, Philippines peso. That was six currencies. That makes my head hurt. And because that jump happens earlier, I think there needs to be tools in place to help those entrepreneurs make that jump. And so um, to be uh, fully transparent, I heard about web agility in a, a mastermind the other day when I was talking about this AF coast and someone said, you, you, you need to look into this. And I, and so that, that's how we got here. That's how, um, we invited you to the show, um, was based off of a recommendation from somebody in a mastermind. And, and so, yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of people that don't know, don't have a great, uh, measuring stick for how well they're doing. And that's scary. It's scary running a business with a blindfold on, and it's a lot different. You know, my first business was selling corn. I sold it for $3 a dozen. It was easy. It was easy to understand. And most businesses are, you know, easier to understand. This is incredibly complex. And and so there needs to be tools there. Um, and yeah, so- yeah, yeah. Listen, I love I love the, um, the 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 details that you've covered. I think this is so relevant. Um, I would just zoom out though and make a broader point. I think I think we need to break this problem down into one of visibility and compliance, like compliance financially, to fine tuning and optimization. I agree. So QuickBooks needs to be the system of record for visibility and compliance. You have to have a financial system of record that gives you the high level, to your point, the P&L. Ideally, man, if you want FCOS related breakdown of fees, we can give you exactly those line items and you can map it to an account in QuickBooks. So you can go crazy with this Um, because we can map to every level of fee detail in WebGility. But I would actually suggest when you think about visibility and compliance, just get the compliance piece right with QuickBooks so your high-level numbers are accurate. And then the second part of that problem is how do I do my fine-tuning and optimization That's where you need more granular financial reporting. And I love that you're talking about this because that's actually exactly where we're be investing right now in WebGility, building more reporting capability to provide line item level profitability. And man, it's a hard problem to solve. (laughs) Yeah. So so my team's hard at work doing this. I'm, I'm giving away secrets a little bit, but yeah, we are building better reporting capabilities to give the business owner granular fee 
SKU level feed details so that you can get a better sense of variability of those fees. As you, you probably know this better than anybody else, they keep introducing new feed types. We don't even know what the hell they mean. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so it's such a moving target because, and by the way, there are fees that are called other fees, and then there are other fees that are called other fees. <laughs> So, so um, it's a moving target. It's a problem that's still unsolved. And, it, you know, experts, I would say, like yourselves, have found ways to create spreadsheets, dive into the right reports to go dig out that data. But I think that's where optimization, fine tuning and scale happens. I find the challenge even at the first step, which is even just getting an aggregate view of your profitability at a channel level, getting even your aggregate, you know, those high level 10 groupings of fees that Amazon gives you, getting that itself gets, I think, most entrepreneurs better informed of what's happening in their profitability and where their margins are. Um, and then I think the next level is to your point that optimization and fine tuning and boy, I've seen some pretty incredible uh Excel spreadsheets out there from our clients who, you know, found like creative ways to dissect it. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, those fees are a mystery, man. And you, you, you definitely got to have, you know, some sort of an Excel sheet, some model and, and yeah, it's, it's to your point, mind boggling. You have to really be a whiz um, at Excel to kind of understand those details Frankly, the companies and entrepreneurs that have invested some time in digging in there are the ones that have found a lot of hidden up margin. They've found a lot of opportunities to grow their margins. Absolutely. And that's if you're in a single digit margin category, that's critical. That is the difference between paying yourself and not paying yourself. And That's right. And, survival and death. Survival yeah, or death. Absolutely. So... All right. Well, this has been an outstanding conversation. I think we could we could sit here for for several more hours chatting, but um at the end of every show, we ask our guests the same four questions. We call it the fire round. Are you ready? Sure. All right. What is your favorite book? Ooh. Um keeps changing as I, you know, learn more, but I think a book that uh, is a is is easy and and maybe a little different. It's not a it's not a book on business. Um, it's called the Art of Living. Um, it's um, it's based on this Stoicism philosophy written by a philosopher Epictetus, and uh, it really talks. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd encourage almost everyone to go read it. And it uh, the very sort of foundational principles even in Buddhism about how. You know, you can only control yourself and you can't control anything outside of you. Um, so I love I love that book. I kind of go back to it whenever uh, I'm having uh, any kind of tough day. It's a, it's a quick read, but uh, yeah, very grounding. Very nice. Very nice. I'll have to add that one to my reading list. Uh, what are your hobbies? Hobbies. Uh, well, I've got two little ones, so I spend a lot of time with them uh, whenever I'm not working. But, uh, you know, I do do enjoy playing a little bit of golf and uh, uh, I do frequent the gym. Um, you know, got to find ways to stay young. That's right. That's right. What is one thing you do not miss about working for the man? Ooh, um, rigidity. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, I, you know, I've always like, I, I love experimenting. I love iterating. I love trying th new things. And I think, you know, working at a large company, your, your hands are often tied. You kind of have to stay within the boundaries. You have to play with, by the rules. And, um, that rigidity can be very constraining. If you can kind of flex your muscle as an entrepreneur, try new things. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but but uh, boy, that freedom to be able to experiment as an entrepreneur, I think, is 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 uh, probably one of the biggest things that keeps me on my seat. Well, absolutely. And uh, last question: What do you think sets apart successful e-commerce entrepreneurs from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Man, you got to have a lot of tolerance for pain. Um, but I would say, you know, if I were to just sort of generalize, I would say it's resilience. It's resilience. Um, I think entrepreneurs 
in general are very optimistic. They're, they're, they're perpetual optimists. Like they think they're going to win, but then as time progresses and you try things and you hit failures and roadblocks, that can really beat you down. Um, and those that have kind of gone that extra mile that continue to be resilient, uh, they have that grit to just keep going are the ones I see uh, often, uh, most often succeed. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, if people are interested in learning more about WebGility, what would be the best way? Yeah, uh, of course, definitely check out WebGility.com. And uh, if you want to connect with me, I do post on LinkedIn. So check out my LinkedIn. It's just Parag Mamnani. Very nice. And we'll post links to all of that in the show notes. Parag, I want to thank you for your time today and looking forward to staying in touch. Love the conversation, David. Thanks so much for having me. Before you go, we wanted to share a new service that Ken and I have been using called Getita that has made us over $10,000 in Amazon reimbursements. The service requires no monthly subscription and Getita collects a small percentage of the money they recover for you. It takes less than five minutes to set up and works on all Amazon marketplaces. Go to getita.com, G-E-T-I-D-A dot com and enter promo code FTM400. That's FTM for Firing the Man 400 to get your first $400 in reimbursements commission free. How much money does Amazon owe you?